In my final year of high school, I had to give a speech in front of the entire school, and it went something like this. You go to school so you can get good grades so that you can get into a good college. Once you're in that good college, you work hard, you get that internship, and you also get good grades so you can find yourself a good job. Once you have that good job, you work for 40 years until you can retire, and then you can enjoy your life then. To me, that sounds awful. And there really don't seem to be very many options for you to break out of that matrix and stop working for their weekends and dreading Monday every single week. You can either marry rich, win the lotto, or you can do like what I did and buy yourself some rental property and earn yourself financial freedom. I personally started investing in real estate at age 24 and by age 27, I hit financial freedom, which just means that my real estate assets cover my income. And now I didn't do so with hundreds of thousands of dollars and I had very little knowledge when it came to real estate other than the few books and podcasts that I read. I personally just wanted to create meaning and perpetual income in my life. And because I was a young, determined 20-something year old, I know there are a lot of you out there. So I'm going to break down the full process of buying that first rental property, some of the struggles and lessons that I learned, and how you can do it yourself. And if you don't know me, my name is Avery. I'm a real estate agent and investor in the Durham, North Carolina area. And today I own over $3 million worth of rental property, both long and short-term rentals. First, let's start off with why you would invest in real estate as opposed to doing anything else to achieve financial freedom. Most people just say that it's you unclogging toilets or fixing a leak here and there, but it's so much more. And now you don't actually have to do any of those things or you could do all of those things, but it's better to treat this as a business. So the number one great reason why you can invest in real estate would be cash flow. Cash flow is awesome because you purchase a property and then theoretically, if you purchase the right one, you can make more money than it costs you to operate that property, which would be things like mortgage and expenses, which we'll get into later on. Second, your property can increase in value. The typical standard appreciation for a property would be 3% annually. Now, now some places see negative appreciation or depreciation and other places see drastically higher appreciation than that 3% amount. The third would be tax benefits. Tax benefits are insane with real estate. Myself, I just did a cost segregation study on one of my short-term rentals and I got a $90,000 tax deduction, which will allow me to take back all of the taxes that I paid on my W-2 job for the year of 2023. If you wanna learn more about that, check out the video up here. The fourth and most important reason, in my opinion, is that you can buy a lot of your time back. Once you achieve financial freedom, you can take more risks and do what you want with your time, whether that's start a business or just sit on your ass. So there's why we do it. Now let's talk about how we do it. And this video might be a little bit longer, but if you sit through it and then actually take some action come the end of it, and not just like the video, because I know you're gonna do that anyway, but call an agent, call a lender, start looking at properties, go to meetups, or do some of the other things that I'm talking about in this video, you can see massive change in your life. The first step in the how would be having a solid financial standing in your life. A solid financial standing for some people might take a day or two because you already have pretty good credit and income. For others, it could potentially take years because you need to get a raise, you need to get a degree, you need to do something in order to get that income up so that you can qualify to buy that property. And when it comes to credit and income, there are a few things that you want in order to be able to qualify so you can buy that property. Now, obviously it really depends on the area that you're in throughout the US or the world on how much that property actually costs. But of course you would need that down payment and you would also need closing costs. Plus you want a little bit of extra money saved over Personally, when I bought my first property, I didn't or really didn't have that much money left over for the property itself in what's called reserves, just in case the roof leaks or some type of system blows up, you do wanna have money for that. So it depends on your risk tolerance or how determined you are. I was very determined, so I ended up taking that risk and it seemed to work out for me. So again, it isn't just that down payment, but you need those other things. And for a credit score, you want to be at least at 740 because at 740 and above, you get the best interest rates. Anything higher doesn't matter, but you do need at minimum a credit score of 580 in order to get an FHA loan. But the worse credit score you have, the higher interest rate that you're going to be paying and the more money you're giving the bank and the less you're putting in your pocket. And now just very simply, if you wanna get a better credit score, all you really need to do is have a mix of credit, make sure that you open those credit cards, pay them off on time and in full and use less than 30% of that revolving credit amount that you get. For the income side, maybe you're starting off on a new job and you don't make that much and it doesn't make sense in the area, but you can start doing a lot of things like cutting all of your expenses so you can save up for that down payment. The first year when I really wanted to save up for that down payment, I literally did nothing else but sit in my apartment, 
read free library books and buy groceries. And I also started a side hustle so I could make extra money to pay for those groceries and save up every penny that I had. And yes, I was really boring and I probably didn't do as many fun things as I should have, but it helped me reach my goal as fast as I wanted to. And the beauty of that year was I only had to live like that for one year. Once I got this going, I started having more money. And today I don't feel really stressed out about spending money on things that I want to. And I'm not a very lavish spender. I'm still very frugal but I'm okay spending some money here or there on things and people that I care about. Second step would be figuring out that strategy. So how are you actually gonna buy this property? What do you plan on doing? And today I'm gonna go through the lens of doing an FHA house hack, but within that house hack, you can also do different types of rental strategies. Maybe you rent by room, maybe you just do a traditional long-term rental, maybe you do a short-term rental. I personally have experience in all of those and it can be very different or potentially far more lucrative if you do one or the other, depending on your situation the property that you buy. And so the most simple strategy to pull off this FHA loan house hack would be you do the FHA loan, which is three and a half percent down. So if you have a $1 million property, that's $35,000, $500,000 property, just under 18,000. And then you move into one unit of a duplex and then you rent out the other unit of the duplex and hopefully that other unit covers your mortgage. Now in today's environment or other environments or most environments or the environment that I started in, it was not that simple. I was able to move into a duplex, rent out one of the bedrooms in the unit that I lived in, plus my girlfriend lived with me and paid a little bit of rent. And then on the other side, they paid me. And then that completely covered my mortgage and a little bit of my expenses which helped me go from paying $1,100 in rent to living for free and saving a lot of money. Now, there are other ways that you can do this. If you can't find yourself in a multifamily property, you could buy a split level home and then live upstairs, rent out the bottom, and then just set it off so that people can't go from one to the other. Maybe there's no kitchen in the basement, but you could also Airbnb out that basement space. People just need a place to stay put a cooktop in there, whatever it may be. You could also do a rent out the room situation. If you had a five bed, three bath, we rent out all other four bedrooms on their own separate leases. You could do something like furnished finder where you rent out to traveling nurses or other corporate professionals who are just looking for a three to nine month or potentially even 12 month lease with furniture. So there are a lot of things that you can do that may make more sense in your area, depending on where you are. Two other cool things that you can do is now you can put 5% down for a conventional loan, which for a three and four unit building means you do not have to pass the FHA self-sufficiency test, which is a really difficult test to pass because 75% of the complete gross rents that you receive for the building have to be greater than or equal to the mortgage with an FHA loan. With a conventional loan, you do not need to care about that. Again, that is only true for three and four unit buildings. Doesn't matter for duplex or single family. Back to the FHA loan though, there's another cool product known as the FHA 203K loan. So let's say you were pre-approved for a $500,000 loan and you find yourself buying a $350,000 property, you could also get yourself an up to $150,000 construction loan through this 203K loan program. Although the FHA 203K loan means that the contractors that you use have to be FHA 203K certified, so it could potentially take longer. But if you just don't have capital, but you have that pre-approval, that's another way to get some money, find a distressed property that you can renovate and get a good amount of equity from. The third step and thing to look at would be your location. Location is obviously very important. I think most people should just start off in their backyard. Now there might be people in Southern California that just want to invest at a distance because it makes more sense with cash flow and the amount of price that you're purchasing a property for and the rent that you're receiving in a different part of the world. But if you can, I would invest in your own backyard and the way you can figure out even what neighborhoods you can invest in in the area that you're in is by getting a pre-approval. So we talked about good financial standing in step one, but before you even go look at properties, you do want to be pre-approved by a lender so you can know what areas you want to buy. I ended up buying in the area that I bought the first time around because I wanted to buy a two to four unit building, but I couldn't buy in a lot of towns in Boston because I did not make enough income to qualify for those properties, but I did make enough income to qualify for the properties in the town that I purchased in, and it's been a great investment. And that leads us into step four, and that would be creating the dream team. Now your dream team could be made up of 10, 20, 30 people, depending on however many people you talk to or work with in this business, because that could go on to attorneys, contractors, title people, 
insurance agent, and a whole bunch of things. But really, it boils down to working with a really solid real estate agent. So that agent, once you have them, should be able to share with you a lender so you can get a pre-approval, contractor so you can do some work on your property once you move in, an attorney so you can close, or a multitude of other people that you might run across in the real estate business to help you out. So it really stems from that agent. I'm a real estate agent myself, and I try to equip the people that I work with, all of these folks, so they can find themselves in a solid transaction and feel like they've been helped along the way. When you're talking to these real estate agents, you need to ask them some key questions so you know whether or not you're gonna work with them. Have you invested before? Are you familiar with this strategy that I am trying to do? What my goals are so that you can understand and help me achieve those. So if you keep telling people your goals and your strategy, it's just going to make these conversations a lot easier. Because I've worked with lenders, for example, that didn't even know that you could live in a three family property and then rent out the other two units. They just didn't comprehend that. But I've talked to other ones where they do that kind of business all the time. Make sure that real estate agent does a few things. They answer you when you try to talk to them. Now, obviously they're people and they go to bed and have families, but they answer you in a timely manner because a lot don't and they also have that knowledge. So where can you find these people? I found real estate agents in a lot of different ways. Obviously through referrals from someone you know is probably the most trusted way to do it, but you may not know anybody yet. So some good ways to do it are through bigger pockets. People reach out to me on bigger pockets all the time because I'm posting in forums, putting in good information, showing that I know what I'm talking about, and I also reach out to people as well. Other places you can do it are through meetups. So I found the very first real estate agent I used through meetups. This is like a networking event. Maybe it's at a bar, maybe it's somewhere else. And you just go talk about real estate and you can meet good people there like this real estate agent who can help you buy your first house hack and your first rental property. And another way to do it would be through Facebook groups. If you just type in the city, state, town that you live in and real estate investing, there's probably like 20 or 30 different Facebook groups out there. And then you could post in a few of them or all of them or whatever you wanna do looking for a real estate agent. And then probably a bunch of them are just gonna reach out to you instantaneously because I do the same thing. And then you can ask them these questions when they call or text you. Okay, now we've done all the pre-work and now it's time to actually start looking at properties in step five, which would be looking at properties and analysis. So you might've caught yourself scrolling through Zillow, looking at properties that you can't afford, but now you're gonna be scrolling through Zillow, looking at properties that you can afford and ones that make sense for you to purchase so you can buy that first rental property. And now you might not have any idea which property makes sense, but at least with that pre-approval, you've been squared away down into one specific location. You know your strategy, so you know you want at least five bedrooms because you're doing a single family house hack. So now you're squared away into that type of property. So you're more zoned in. Now you can look at every single five bedroom in the area and see what each room could rent for. You could see what the total thing could rent for. And then you can also figure out what all the expenses will be. Because you're working with a lender, you understand what a mortgage would be because they've given you what the interest rate could be. And you know that there's going to be things that go wrong and things that break that you have to account for. In order to figure out what the rent may be, there are a number of different ways that you can do that. When I first started looking, the real estate agent I used because he was awesome, really helped me out with that. So he was able to give me some comps, see what the low end of rent was and the high end of rent was if you were able to renovate. You can also just go on something like Zillow or apartments.com, look at properties for rent in the area, see what they're renting for. Another great service that I actually use quite a bit is Rentometer, and I'm not sponsored by Rentometer, but you're able to just go in, type the address, number of bedrooms, bathrooms, and then see a full report if you pay for it. If you don't pay for it, you get five free reports. Uh, it's a great little service in my opinion. Not super accurate all the time because it'll just dial in a location and look at all three bedrooms, all five bedrooms around it. So if you find yourself in a single family house versus a luxury apartment complex, they're gonna call those the same thing and put them into one average, but you're smart so you know that a single family house is not the same as a luxury apartment complex with a pet washing station and a pool, and those are not comps. And then the last way that you can find out what things should rent for is using section eight. So each of the towns that you would live in will have some type of housing authority and they will list the amount of rent that they would pay a one to five bedroom section eight housing voucher. So once you can see what section eight's paying, sometimes it's more than market rent. But one thing that's important to note if you're looking at that is that the amount of rent that section eight will pay also includes utilities. So if you pass the utility payment onto the tenant, water, electric, gas, all that stuff, 
usually you should knock off about 200 250 dollars to get that actual amount that they'd pay you because you want the tenants to pay those utilities or else in the dead of winter they're going to open the windows and blast the heat so you can sort of do all that stuff on your head but if you want to get a real number down personally i use my own cash flow analysis tool which you can put in the purchase price the interest rate a bunch of other assumptions, how much rent that you're receiving. And then it also shows all of those expenses because there's gonna be some vacancy between when you're renting out your unit to a tenant. Maybe you gotta paint the walls and a month goes by and you still have to pay for the mortgage and you don't have a tenant in yet. Maybe the toilet breaks and you have to pay a handyman to come out and fix that. Maybe you pay for property management. There's a whole lot of things that you could pay for and stuff you have to save up for before you actually get to that positive cash flow number. So I personally like being able to use a calculator spreadsheet because that helps you a lot with feeling, hey, is this gonna be a good deal? It looks good on paper, so now it's worth checking out. So if you're able to put those numbers in, do the correct assumptions and not fudge it so that it seems better to you, then it's time that you could go look at some properties. And that leads us to our next step, which would be physically walk the properties. Because sometimes on paper, when you look at numbers, they look really good, but the property is a piece of crap. And to me, this is where an agent with solid experience who understands construction as an invested themselves is going to be your best friend when you actually get into the property. Because when you're actually there and you're just using an inexperienced person like yourself, if you try to be your own agent and you've never done any real estate before, you don't know what to look for. You don't know what issues there are in front of you and you don't know how much it costs to fix them. So maybe on paper it looked awesome. You were gonna get a 10% cash on cash return with this property, which just means if you put $50,000 down, that it would take you 10 years in order to get all of that $50,000 back, which is the 10% cash on cash return. Maybe I didn't explain that super well, but really it just means the amount of money you put in and how long it takes you to get it back. So on paper, it looks like a great investment, but then when you get in there, you know, the real estate agent shows, oh, the whole house is completely screwed. It's gonna cost you $75,000 to fix it. Boom, right there. It's probably not the best one for you to take on as your first investment. I think this was extremely valuable with my first real estate agent. He taught me a lot. He taught me how much stuff costs. He taught me what would and what would not be a good investment. And personally, I think for your earlier rental properties, when you're getting into it, the best things to find are houses that are fairly solid structurally, have pretty relevantly new systems, doesn't have to be super new but things that you don't have to fix right away and it's just cosmetically ugly so you can paint it you can add flooring you can change some of those things some of the easier things to do if you even want to learn how to do them yourself but not something where you have to tear it all down and build it all back up again because you probably don't know what's going on and you're going to make a mistake and it will also cost a lot so really when you walk those properties you're going to learn either the numbers do make sense and it's a good property or the numbers look way better than they were and it's not a good property or they put the property at way too high of a price and you can offer $100,000 less and that way you can get in and now the number makes sense. And that leads us into point number seven, our offers. Obviously you can't buy a rental property unless you put an offer out on a rental property. It's pretty simple, but a lot of people get scared at this point because they don't want to offend someone. They don't want to put out an offer because they don't think it's going to get accepted. Well, you do miss 100% of the shots that you don't take, said Michael Scott. So if you don't put out an offer, the worst thing that's going to happen is that you don't get an offer accepted. And if you do put it out an offer, the worst thing they're going to still say is your offer isn't accepted. So whether you put it out or not, it still might have the same outcome, but at least when you put offers out, they can get accepted. So really here, you just need to make sure that you do make offers, look at properties, stay consistent, and don't get thrown off and feel like everyone's against you and you're never gonna find that property. You just keep looking and looking, it will eventually happen for you as long as you stay persistent. Keep making those offers and don't be afraid to just throw out a low number that works for you. Because worst case, you don't get that property for too high of a price that you knew wouldn't work, you would only get it for the price that you wanted it for. One caveat I will make, if you're in the North Carolina area, this is one of the three states in the US where you have to put down a due diligence fee. This is a non-refundable deposit that you put down into a property that allows you to back out at any time, but the second the contract is accepted, you lose all that money, it goes directly to the seller. So this is also why I like you having a really solid real estate agent on your side, so they can do a pretty solid pre-inspection before you get that contract accepted, so you know what you're walking into. Now they might miss something, that's why you get an inspection done, but just something to note that in a few states in the US, you do have this non-refundable deposit. And the last step would be post acceptance. Now a lot will happen between when your property is accepted and when you actually close on it, but a lot of it really isn't up to you. You're gonna get an inspection done, there will be an appraisal that a bank will look at to see if you paid too much for the property or potentially too little and you have instant equity, 
That rarely happens though. And then you actually close on the property and get keys. And hopefully unlike me, those keys actually unlock the property. And with that inspection, you can potentially negotiate some of the price, lower it, ask the seller to do some type of repairs, or you could get a seller credit so it goes towards your closing costs. And there are a few things, but really you're just there to enjoy the ride and get ready for the fun stuff that comes with owning a rental property. And I didn't get into next steps when you actually own the property, but if you wanna learn how to automate that rental property management, or at least make it a lot easier, you can check out the video in the description below. I go over all of that, all the tools that I use to make it easy for you. And a lot of those, if not all of them are free, so not a lot of expenses on your end besides managing that property. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that video. And if you did, please subscribe so you can learn more about investing in real estate and the agent business. And if you haven't done so, please scroll down and make that thumbs up button blue. I know you like the look of it because I like it too. And if you're looking to buy property or sell or invest in the North Carolina area or really anywhere because I can send you a referral of someone who I know and trust, then hit me up and I can help you find that person that can help you find the thing that you're looking for to create that financial freedom. So thanks again for watching and more wealth is coming your way.